Welcome back to Bacterial Dynamics. <coughs> okay, Taba, you may start. Okay, kita. So, Sam, saya start dulu, eh. Okay, okay, you may start. Okay, Taba. Okay. okay. Okey, yang berusaha Prof. Madya Dr. Muhammad Tazli Azizan, penceramah bagi kursus hari ini, yang dihormati Dr. Tuan dan Puan sekalian. Selamat pagi dan salam sejahtera. Dengan ini dapat kita bersama-sama untuk mengikuti online training Hightel siri ketiga iaitu Flipping Your Assessment. Okey, sebelum kita memulakan kursus hari ini, pihak kami ingin mengucapkan ribuan terima kasih kepada Prof. Madya Dr. Muhammad Tazli Azizan kerana sudi untuk meluangkan masa pada pagi ini dan juga kami sangat menghargakan kehadiran tuan-tuan dan puan-puan. Okey, hadirin sekalian. Dengan ini saya ingin memperkenalkan pencerama kita pada hari ini. Prof. Madya Dr. Muhammad Tazli Azizan merupakan pensyarah di Jabatan Kejuruteraan Kimia Universiti Teknologi Petronas UTP. Okay, beliau telah memperolehi PhD dalam bidang kejuruteraan kimia dari Imperial College yang dibiayai oleh beasiswa Commonwealth pada tahun 2014. Okay, kemudian beliau dilantik sebagai pengarah untuk Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning dan juga pengarah untuk memperjuangkan inisiatif pedagogi pembelajaran berpusatkan pelajar SEL di UTP. Seterusnya, beliau juga dilantik sebagai salah satu anggota pasukan petugas pembaharuan dasar pendidikan nasional sejak Oktober 2018 hingga April 2019 berkhidmat dengan bekas Menteri Pendidikan. Okey, pada tahun 2019, beliau juga dipinjamkan ke Perak ICT dan Multimedia GLC Digital Perak sebagai Ketua Pegawai Eksekutif selama sembilan bulan. Selain itu, beliau melakukan penyelidikan tentang nilai-nilai dan pembelajaran mendalam dalam pendidikan kejuruteraan melalui pendekatan SEL yang berbeza. Uh, research interest beliau adalah dalam bidang catalytic reaction engineering, biomass development, production of biofuel dan biochemical. Okay, betul tak doktor? Semua maklumat ini saya dapat daripada blog doktor. Boleh tak doktor? Okay. Okay tanpa, <laughs> oh, yeah. okay, okay, tanpa membuang masa, kita ingin menjemput Prof. Madya Dr. Muhammad Tazli Azizan untuk memulakan sesi online training pada pagi ini. Jadi dengan segala hormatnya, dipersilakan Prof. Madya Dr. Muhammad Tazli Azizan. Uh, thank you very much. Terima kasih okay. kepada Madam, uh, Madam eh, Tambah Surya. Ya, yeah, betul. Uh, Puan Samsia dan um, seterusnya para hadirin yang yang uh, saya hormati sekalian lah. Um, okay, I'm going to turn on my camera. And then I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, saya, uh, I hope that is okay for you lah kalau saya mix up English dengan bahasa Melayu. Boleh eh? Boleh doktor. Boleh, boleh. Okay. Kita satu santai je. Ah. Okay, so uh, the topic I, I, I just a little bit lah sebab um, I told that the rate of point time is flipping your assessment tapi I said okay uh, because we are actually currently in during the PKP so I said okay it's supposed to be flipping your assessment the PKP way eh? um, because um, we actually in the current 
in the current um, context right now memang kita dalam keadaan yang berbeza it's not a simply a simple normal online learning that we are doing is a, a little bit different thing okay that we had never done before so uh, the way how we actually teach in our class the way how we actually give assessment to our students uh, are totally different okay so these are the outlines that i'm going to share with you Apa benda yang saya nak kongsikan kepada tuan-tuan dan puan-puan sekalian um, First of all is to clearly identify What is emergency remote teaching? Apa itu normal online learning? Okay And then we're going to look at some guiding principles So that by using this particular guiding principles It will help you It will help us to make sure that Our instruction is right Our assessment is correct Okay It's correctly done so kita bukan nak buat assessment sesaja ataupun kita bukan nak buat uh, instruction berbeza-beza saja-saja tapi there must be a framework that we are actually following. The third one is we going to look at um, formative and alternative assessment. So what are the online assessment tools that we can use out there and um, how we can use it, how we can leverage it further for our for our teaching. And finally, on the flip assessment, some brief ideas. So these are the topics that I'm going to discuss in very further. Um, what does it mean by flip assessment? And towards the end is about becoming an empathetic educator. So I'll be sharing with you some of the tips and tricks and how we can do best to ensure that our students are learning. And finally, um, I'll, I'll do some question and answer. Okay. Right. So before we move further, I would like you to take your mobile. Can we go to www.menti.com with code 1562.74? Okay. So saya akan buka ke slide sini. Saya, okay. So sekarang ni pergi dekat www.menti.com and guna code ni 1562.74. And please answer this uh, question while I'm sipping my coffee. <laughs> the question more or less is about asking what assessment that you do work in face-to-face -face, but not during emergency remote teaching. Okay, reading test. Can I have more response here? Boleh access ke? <laughs> okay, sebab uh, tak nampak tadi. Okay, right. Now it's coming in. Uh, tutorial, exercise, forum, quiz and etc. So that cannot be done during ERT. Um, so this is something different using Google Meet and Flipgrid for online learning. Hands on session. Uh, working face to face using Glassboard directly to student and can see what's the obstacle. So those are the limitation for you. Uh, lecturing, quiz online, assignment online, some of the statistics software not available during MCO. Okay. So the question is, apa benda yang sebenarnya masa face to face dengan online learning biasa boleh berlaku tapi masa sekarang ni susah. Okay. 
explaining calculation. So explaining calculation is a bit difficult for you, right? Provide more verbal feedback, okay? Anybody else would like to share something? Apa lagi yang sebenarnya kita dah terbiasa buat masa face to face tapi bila buat online learning, bila buat emergency remote teaching ni uh, bila buat emergency remote teaching especially we face some difficulty <coughs> Okay, monitoring them during assessment Show design sketching mm -hmm. Kena pasang kamera lah tunjuk kan Uh, doing laboratory work, okay, I know that is a challenge Even it's not subsist, it cannot be substitute directly dengan virtual, virtual lab work eh Anything else? Teach students to read construction drawing and do a measurement based on drawing Teach students to read construction drawing and do measurement based on drawing. Mm -hmm. Ada apa lagi yang kita yang boleh share? Okay, so uh, kalau daripada sini kita tengok um, feedback daripada tuan-tuan dan perempuan sebenarnya macam ada benda yang kita miss lah. Ada, ada benda yang kita miss contohnya masa zaman face to face kita dah terbiasa buat exercise, hands on calculation kita ada laboratory session kita guna, walaupun kita guna software tapi because of we are actually um, apa staying apart so at the moment nak request certain kind of software pun tak dapat nak guna so we of of course we have certain kind of limitation okay so in that, in, in that way we need to be very clear of actually what does it mean by emergency remote teaching versus normal online learning sebab Many of the time, many of the time, kita tak um, tak ramai sebenarnya orang yang tahu sebenarnya um, this particular differences. They feel that we can easily convert whatever that we do in face to face terus jadi emergency remote teaching uh, dalam dalam kelas during emergency remote teaching, which is not the same. Saya ambil case di um, senario yang berlaku seperti mana yang di share dalam paper ni eh, by Hodges 2020 ni. Um, dia mention dia kata salah satu senario emergency remote teaching ni yang berlaku dulu masa di Afghanistan di Afghanistan ni because um, there are war during that time and lepas tu uh, Taliban ambil alih kan uh, negara and the ladies are not allowed to go to school okay uh, ladies tak boleh pergi sekolah, tak boleh pergi universiti so what they did during that time ada NGO yang convertkan all this uh, material ni dalam bentuk DVD So the ladies uh, stay at home and they learn uh, from home, okay? They learn from home. Of course with certain kind of limitation. Contohnya learn from that DVD tu lah. Okay. So similarly to what happened right now, we are not allowed to go to face-to-face -face punya mode. Okay? Bila student-student yang uh, sekarang ni belajar dengan kita dan kita sendiri sebagai educators, we do not sign up untuk jadi pengajar online. Kan? Kita ni sign up untuk ajar face-to-face. Itu yang kita, kita kita buat Sama juga dengan student They sign up to the university not to become uh, Not not to end up studying online Not to end up learning online Tapi they are actually sign up to come for face to face Lainlah kalau contohnya dia from open university kan Yang tah, yang yang memang dia dah tahu In order for them in order for them to study, to learn They need to do to do it online Yang mana they have to make sure Connection dia okay and so on By the moment right now, we have a problem because not all the students cannot can afford that. Okay, we have to bear that in mind. Maksudnya ada isu-isu yang timbul semasa berlakunya emergency remote teaching ni. Contohnya, uh, apa dimaksudkan sini, dia kata emergency remote teaching is a temporary shift of instruction and delivery to an alternate delivery mode due to crisis circumstances. So we have, we are actually in a crisis right now. So the primary objective in these circumstances is not to recreate a robust educational ecosystem but rather to provide temporary access to instruction and instructional support. Okay, 
so so that it become reliable during an emergency or crisis here what happened is that when we are conducting emergency remote teaching the control lies into the lecturer maksudnya the faculty members kita sebagai educator kita yang sepatutnya mempunyai greater control to decide what we going to do to make sure that our students learn okay that is the first thing so apa yang kita kena buat sekarang seperti mana um, tuan-tuan perempuan uh, doktor sekalian that you are actually attending this kind of training to equip yourself well to make sure that you have the control to make sure your students learn itu yang kita buat kan kita attend training here and then just to make sure that we are able to make sure that the students are learning okay so general issues during emergency remote teaching is such as internet accessibility and affordability okay uh, masa PKP yang part 1 tu kita okey lagi sebab some of the students are still at the campus so while at the campus they got a good internet connectivity but some of them now bila dia dah disperse they went back to their hometown some of them living far away remote area kan seperti mana yang kalau tuan-tuan dan perempuan tengok ada video YouTube yang quite viral daripada Viviana baru ni kan uh, she had to climb the trees in order for her to get internet connection so only that she could answer the, the test, the exam um, so that is in term of internet accessibility okay and some of the students you know that they could afford internet but because they are living in certain area that they could not do that so tuan macam saya kalau balik perlis a bit struggle lah kan sebab um, yang ada kat situ yes 4G so I have to make sure that I have sim card yes 4G baru boleh uh, apa uh, apa dapat internet yang strong okay otherwise memang internet line siput yang yang susah lah nak buat nak buat kan nak buat assessment all those kind of thing uh, second one is internet affordability we know that some of our students uh, walaupun dia duduk dekat kawasan-kawasan yang uh, yang yang what do you call that? a good area yang accessible internet data speed tinggi tapi tak semestinya dia can afford mungkin dia ada kekangan dari segi contohnya the uh, kita masuk isu kedua social and economic crisis family yang ada masalah kewangan dan sebagainya they could not afford to have a good internet so everybody had to share kan sampai that's why that's what happened in at our schools right now online learning ni is not that possible because sometimes satu gadget sampai empat lima orang share the same gadget um, so that is in term of the social and economic crisis another one is actually mental readiness among the students as well as faculty members as well so but when you do online teaching if let's say you can realize that some of our students dia tak ada comfort zone macam kita, kita dah terbiasa work from home okay, slide get lecturer dan nanti kita buat publication whatsoever kita ada space kita sendiri, right tapi students, they may not be ready with that okay um, some of them, I end up seeing them uh, duduk dekat dapur just to make sure that they listen they can focus to whatever that has been taught online so that is somehow mental readiness we need to be, be ready with the students as well we need to support them more lah and then the final one is technology adoption among faculty members and I know that this is our challenge because kita nak belajar satu dua tu pun it takes some time some of us feel that macam this is too much very overwhelming as for me as well I, I do not want to actually to uh, explore too much uh, tools actually I just want to focus on certain tools but I know that that tools work and and I and most importantly is how I can actually pedagogically make it right okay uh, because a tool is just a tool tapi kalau kita guna dengan pedagogi yang betul dengan teknik yang betul that is actually it will make the engagement okay so we're going to look a little, a little bit on the constructive alignment and how could people learn framework so this is uh, constructive alignment ni lah satu benda yang tidak asing lah kalau kita kata pada higher education when we actually formulate our program outcomes, our cost outcome, uh, we must make sure that <coughs> and, and we must make sure that everything is constructively aligned. For example, <coughs> when we set up the learning outcomes, the intended outcomes must be clearly be indicated. So, kita belajar pasal belum taxonomy tu kan, C1 sampai C6 kan, to apply, to assess, to understand, to, um, to create, to evaluate. So, all those things, bila kita uh, spell out that learning outcome tu bukan sesaja kita guna those particular verbs because what we have to make sure that our teaching and learning activities must match that outcome contohnya kalau kita buat to evaluate 
um, the difference between A and D contohnya. So when we actually spell out that as a learning outcome, kita mesti make sure teaching and learning activities kita ialah be able to evaluate. Maksudnya students memang melakukan to evaluation tu antara A dengan B tadi ni. Okay. Dan bila kita buat assessment, kita must make sure that students memang betul-betul dapat evaluate buat comparison antara A dengan B tadi ni. So that is actually assess internet outcome. So when we actually make sure that kita ada learning outcome kita dan kita buat activities dengan assessment dia jive together only then we call it as constructively aligned. The problem with us is actually whenever that we we have this particular learning, learning outcome, kita tak actually follow exactly what is the learning outcome. Contohnya bila kita sebut high learning outcome ni contohnya macam to create something or to perform something Tapi teaching and learning activities kita, kita bagi lecture Kita bagi lecture. Lepas tu bila kita assessment, kita minta dia create something Of course the students tu tak akan dapat untuk create that, those things Dia tak akan make that particular outcome kan? Especially kalau kita spell out learning outcome, kita ialah something yang kena capai tahap kebat okay? Kemahiran berfikir aras tinggi tetapi kalau kita cuma buat sekadar lecture semata-mata tanpa ada activity thinking, tanpa ada activity discussion, tanpa ada activity yang they have to get together some kind of elements of project for example dia hanya be able to reach C1 and C2 saja, Be able to define something, to be able to understand something. Sebab itulah kadang-kadang kita wonder kenapa lah dah ajar susah-susah dah bagi lecture macam-macam assessment still dapat teruk, still fail the subject. Mungkin kita kena reflect balik sebenarnya the way how actually that we taught in the class the way the, 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 by just giving lecture okay it's not actually suitable for that Sama juga kalau kita bagi assessment yang level C1, C2 tapi kalau kita buat teaching and learning activities yang um, higher level kan kita nak minta student to explain or assess some, uh, ataupun to discuss something tapi kita buat sampai problem based learning dalam kelas kita yang memang high end yang kita tapi tengok-tengok jadi student dia dia akan complain lah sebab dia kata susahnya nak buat benda-benda macam ni sebab assessment dia cuma minta to explain and to understand something kan jadi benda tu tak jive so we have to make sure that everything that we do tu it has to be jive together it has to be aligned together so this is what we call as constructive alignment okay that so that is the first framework yang kita kena assess second one is um So what happen here is that assessment tu dia akan drive learning. Students will learn according to how we assess them. Okay. <coughs> Kalau kita bagi assessment yang mudah, assessment dia ialah dengan menghafal, dia akan menghafal je lah. Okay. So yang kedua ialah how people learn framework. Okay. How people learn framework ni um, is a study made by uh, JD Bransford in 2000. Dia actually dia study more than 1000 ways of people learn. Um, is a meta punya analysis towards this, okay dia buat analysis kepada analysis yang banyak-banyak tu and then what he coined, dia ada coin empat lenser empat lens yang kalau dia kata if let's say we fulfill all these four lens and this is the way how to make sure that people learn okay, so dia ada knowledge centered lens learner centered, assessment centered and community centered and all of these four are actually interconnected to each other. Okay, maksudnya dia memang ada subset to each other. Dia ada 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 link eh. Okay, dia macam Venn diagram ni is actually dia dia overlap to each other. Okay, so what does it mean by this particular four lens? First of all, about we talk about knowledge centered. So knowledge centered ni ialah knowledge outcomes organized around fundamentals of this of a discipline, right? Antara salah satu ciri kalau kita ni buat knowledge centered lens ialah apabila kita nak introduce new things kepada students, new topics kepada students, we always make sure that this particular students uh, kita build up dia punya knowledge tu dengan old knowledge. Sama ada kita build up on top of the kita build up the new knowledge on top of the no, uh, old knowledge ataupun kita kita combine it together. Contohnya kalau kita nak ajar satu subjek baru. So kita kena relate dengan previous subjek yang dah dia pernah belajar. Kalau contohnya dia baru masuk kepada ke universiti, kita kena relate dengan something yang dia belajar masa SPM dulu. Ataupun yang paling mudah ialah sebenarnya kita kita boleh tengok apa yang ada di sekeliling kita untuk kita relatekan dengan apa yang dia faham. Contohnya selalu saya bila saya ngajar subjek saya, uh, is a chemical engineering, uh, the, the topic is material and energy balance. Of course saya tak boleh nak cerita pasal chemical plant yang banyak kepada student saya sebab mereka tak boleh imagine chemical plant tu how does it look like. 
So I have to find things that I can associate with this. Contohnya saya kena cari something to do with cooking, something to do with gardening, something to do with whatever surrounding them that they could see. Ada satu topik yang saya kena ajar ialah pasal absorption. Okay, AD. Uh, Ni lah maksudnya. Macam mana nak ajar pasal absorption ni? Jadi saya relatekan dengan water filter yang ada kat rumah. Okay, so that is actually how do you relate this topic. You you organize around fundamentals and then you make sure that the old knowledge too is built on top, uh, the new knowledge too is built on top of the old knowledge. That is what we call as knowledge center. Yang kedua ialah we talk about uh, learner center. Learner center ni ialah we take into the learner's background, preconception and connections to real life context. Contohnya dekat sini, kita kena faham bahawa pelajar-pelajar kita ni background ni ialah action punya background. Okay, so kita nak ajar konteks kita, kita tak boleh nak ambil western punya examples for them. We must take something yang examples yang dekat di hati dia orang because we understand this is their background. And of and when when I talk about internet issues just now kan, because we are teaching it online, these are also part of the learner centered punya issues. Kita kena tahu bahawa um, how many of our students actually have the internet accessibility? How many of our students really have problem to get connection to the internet? Okay, so these are the things that we need to talk through to the students. So apa yang saya selalu buat when uh, starting of the semester, I always gather, contohnya minta student buat speed test. Okay, buat speed test and then lepas tu bagi kat kita then we can see uh, apa student ni, connection ni macam mana macam mana. Jadi kita dia boleh memberikan gambaran daripada kita how our class would look like. But the best for us for now is actually to combine between synchronous and asynchronous activities. Any type of synchronous punya activities kita record kan so that Student-student yang tak berkesempatan untuk attend the session, they be able to uh, watch it later. Dan pasti sebenarnya bila kita tahu some of our student, even single student pun menghadapi masalah internet um, accessibility ni, we must make sure that dia tak tertinggal di belakang because we have to understand the mental state. Many of our students, bila dia duduk dekat seorang-seorang kat rumah study, they feel disconnected. Okay, so how do we make sure that we support them mentally? So these are also part of the learner centered near issues. Another thing what we call is assessment centered. Assessment centered ni ialah is a combination between um, summative and formative assessment. <coughs> summative ialah something yang kita grade, formative ialah something that we actually will be able to give feedback to the students. Okay? So feedback kepada students ni, it doesn't have to be every student must get their own personal feedback. Sebab ada yang pernah tanya saya contohnya macam how do I make sure that um, I give personal feedback kepada the students sampai kalau seru, student sampai seratus lebih kan? Macam mana nak bagi personal feedback to all? Yang penting ialah kita kena bagi feedback kepada mereka in general so that they know okay, if I'm doing this, um, is, is it right or wrong? Is it is it correct? That this is the way of correct or not? Tapi kalau kita contohnya nak bagi feedback tu selepas kita marking dia punya assessment selepas kita, dia, contohnya selepas dia jawab test kadang-kadang tak menyempat, right? Even in our face-to-face -face punya online face-to-face uh, -face punya session pun kadang-kadang kita bagi test kat dia markah test tu dekat hujung-hujung sebelum dia nak ambil exam baru dia dapat jadi dia tak sempat correct dia punya misconception So how do we do that? This is where actually we do formative assessment Formative assessment ni there are many tools that we can use I can share with you One of it is just now that I use Mentimeter That is a formative assessment Okay, because whenever that the students respond to it, you can see directly whether the majority understand what you are trying to say ataupun sebenarnya dia ada pre-misconception daripada awal that you need to fix. So these are the things that you make sure that you give uh, the, the right feedback to the students. Okay, at the same time, the students to be able to reflect themselves. Okay, whether they are on the right path or actually they, they are a bit astray kan dari segi pembelajaran dia. Um, and and then they'll be able to actually when whenever that we doing this, uh, the students uh, should be able to have assessment as learning as well. Maksudnya kita jadikan assessment ni, penilaian ni sebagai part of learning ni. Contohnya bila dia buat assessment tu, oh macam ni sebenarnya. So, oh sebelum ni kefahaman aku salah. While doing the assessment, we can do that. Okay, uh, so that is the third lens, uh, the third lens, knowledge centered, learner centered and assessment centered. And yang terakhir ialah community centered. Community center ni ialah di mana student dengan pengajar ni is a part of learning community. So we need to create a safe online learning community for our students to support each other. So kita kena create the environment such that 
students ni not totally dependent on us but also they can depend on their peers as well. So how do we create that online learning community that the students tak adalah macam hari kalau dia nak tanya pun direct soalan nak tanya pada kita tapi they can also ask question among their peers and they feel safe to do so. So if let's say you have these four elements, four lenses ni, insyaAllah the people, uh, the students will learn effectively well. Okay, so this is the second guideline that we always use to make sure that the students uh, learn effectively and can be assessed well. Lah. The third thing that we should do is actually we talk about scaffolding. Okay, scaffolding ni ialah di mana um, uh, Vygotsky ni dia memperkenalkan dia panggil zone of proximal development. Zone of proximal development ni ialah distance between individual performance and performance with social support. Okay, dia kata dia highlight kat sini, kalau sebenarnya kalau kita tak tolong student kita 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 tak bagi tangga kat benda, contohnya kita imagine students ni dia nak panjat pokok, eh, dia nak panjat, dia nak uh, petik buah apple okay, dia nak petik buah apple tapi dia tak cukup ketinggian dia untuk sampai petik buah apple tu kalau dia lompat-lompat pun dia sebenarnya tak sampai juga buah apple tu jadi kita sebagai educator kita bagi dia tangga kat dia kita bagi dia tangga supaya dia dapat naik tangga tu dan dia dapat petik buah tu Lama-lama dia, dia tinggi kan, dia dah pandai taktik dia sendiri Lepas tu lama-lama kita cabut tangga tu Okay, so that is actually what we call as scaffolding Okay, scaffolding ni lah bukan satu benda yang permanent Satu benda yang temporary kita kita sediakan lepas tu kita tarik balik Okay, sebab kalau kita tak buat scaffolding Students will maintain just at individual level Tapi kalau kita provide some kind of scaffolding This is what actually will bring students to another level We call it assisted level In a way that, kalau kita imagine dia naik tangga ni lah kan nak sampai intended learning outcome ni kita dah spell out kita punya learning outcomes dalam course kita some of the students, dia mungkin naik lima anak tangga dia terus sampai ILO some of the students, they may need to climb 50 to 20 stairs in order for them to reach this ILO and we do with, we do with it is teaching and learning activities and assessment task ni sebenarnya yang akan support dan yang akan scaffold dia okay Lama-lama barulah dia akan sampai kepada intended learning outcome tersebut lah Okay, so we need to think of whenever that we actually doing teaching and learning activities Whenever that we give assessment to the students Whenever we give group project kepada students How do we actually we scaffold them? <coughs> how do we actually support them? So that is um, This is where actually the the role of scaffolding Is very important that uh, to be played Okay So in order for us to to use the right instruction or assessment uh, there are certain guidelines yang pertama sekali kita kena define kita punya outcome what is the outcome yang kita nak uh, create <coughs> what is the outcome yang kita nak achieve objective kita nak achieve so, lepas tu kita kena create activities assessment that will bring up the active verb in the outcome macam saya cakap tadi lah contohnya perkataan to create to analyze to evaluate to apply how do we make sure that assessment yang kita create, aktiviti yang kita create tu akan menyebabkan budak-budak tu apply akan menyebabkan the students tu to evaluate akan menyebabkan the students tu to create something so these are the things that we have to think of the, sec, the third one is we need to decide <coughs> what kind of guidance that we need and what are the kind of scaffolding that we give dan kita kena try and we make revision and usually when we give this kind of assessment we need to think about um, sometimes in terms of the duration okay semalam uh, ada ada webinar by professor richard felder um, he is one of the prominent um, engineering education punya guru lah uh, worldwide he <coughs> he talk about online active learning but i think yang uh, but but he didn't talk about it uh, yesterday lah but i remember that when i attended his session last time Whenever that we make certain kind of assessment, kita kena try it out dulu. And in order for us to give the duration kepada student kita, kita multiply with three. Okay, so contohnya kalau kita nak try buat soalan tu, it takes one hour for us. So we need to multiply with three. The three hours is actually allocated for the student. Kalau kita buat open-ended, contohnya open-ended assessment, kita rasa kita boleh solvekan benda ni, kita dah buat semua, kita solve dalam masa dua jam. So the students, they should be given six hours in order for them to complete that. Okay, so this is, um, kalau kita tak try, I think uh, kalau kita tak try jawab, I think kita 
menzalimi diri kita dan student lah sebenarnya. Okay, because the students ni dia tak boleh simply kalau kita simply terus suruh dia buat dan kita kita takut nanti estimation of time kita tak betul. It's not correct. Okay, so that is uh, one of the things that we need to do lah when actually we give uh, assessment kepada our students. <coughs> right. So I have another questions. Can you respond to me on this? How do we actually make sure that our students learning during emergency remote time? <coughs> Macam mana kita nak pastikan student kita belajar during emergency remote time? Maybe you can answer. Jawab dalam bahasa Melayu tak apa tau. Jangan risau. Kita orang Malaysia. Okay, they respond by asking questions about the topic recently taught. Ask them to answer some questions by randomly calling their name. Prepare short or fun quiz for every week lesson. Actually use quizzes, okay. Provide short question related to the previous topic during class. Uh, always check on their well-being, for example. Call them if they did not submit their task. Mm -hmm. <coughs> lagi? Ada lagi? How do we ensure our students learning during this ERP? Boleh cuba jawab lagi? <laughs> Sedap lain lain. Post question through WhatsApp or some sort of using um, other tools available. Um, okay. Give a task and hand it in on that time. Mm -hmm. Monitoring the student by asking the question, short assessment during online class. Okay. Provide questions regarding to the topic and ask them to submit it. <coughs> okay, through the submission. Mm -hmm. Ada lagi idea tak? Macam mana kita nak make sure our students ni belajar semasa, semasa tempoh di manusia remote teaching ni? Okay, I do not get any further response or is there anybody else still typing? Okay, so Kalau kita tengok sini, the response from uh, some some of you here is actually is about uh, is always about assessment kan? Maksudnya kalau kita kata kita nak bagi something, kita nak check sama ada student kita belajar ataupun tak, we need to assess them. Okay, and then some of the assessment tu is mix up. So you can see here, some of us actually we conduct online session. So we when we conduct online class, Lepas tu kita kena kita buat uh, some kind of quiz so that uh, students will be able to respond to it or not. <coughs> but we also have to think about actually students yang tak boleh nak join online class kita, okay? Because of um, because of the certain difficulties that tadi. How do we make sure that they actually learn, okay? 
So these are the things that um, dan kita 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 pun tahu kan contohnya macam yang kes dekat sekolah-sekolah sekarang ni some of the students left the WhatsApp group. Kan? Sampai block nombor cikgu dia. Sebab cikgu dia bagi terlebih banyak assignment. Right? So um, we also need to consider kenapa sebenarnya sometimes the students did did so. Maybe not so much for university students tapi kepada uh, kepada students with um, apa on in the secondary school contohnya kan because sometimes the assignment is too much sometimes i would say that sebenarnya <coughs> assignment yang kadang-kadang diberikan tu pun kadang-kadang tidak memenuhi outcomes yang sebenarnya kita nak apa student kita jadi so uh, repetitive uh, assignment yang terlalu uh, banyak yang tidak ada support yang tidak ada scaffolding this is what actually menyebabkan students kita fall apart okay Uh, under, our understanding of the mental uh, mental fitness of our students is also needed lah okay so here this is highlight I was keep in touch with the students regarding their participation and understanding by providing tasks such as mind map recall question after watch video lessons quiz in quizzes okay so uh, thank you very much for the feedback I think similarly kalau kita buat macam kelas online macam ni pun end up kita sebenarnya kita je yang cakap kan eh? Yang lain kalau kita tengok sampai 75 orang pun they are not responding to your mentimeter. Okay, so um, this similar situation happen in our class. Okay, some of our students choose not to respond to our feedback. But that is okay. Okay, but that is okay because in usual class when we conduct this kind of uh, learning session that's why I, saya, I always keep my class small. Um, I used to give a lecture to nearly 200 students online tapi I feel that it is not that effective because uh, because I know that some of the students may not may just actually put it on the audio but they are doing something else right uh, but if let's say you want you really want to keep an engaging your class uh, a small class around 20 to 30 is sufficient when actually you can just start uh, for example you can you can do the call names tapi you can you cannot call names straight away okay there are certain techniques that you can use in your class in order for you before you call names because tadi uh, ask them to answer question by randomly calling their name uh, there are ways of doing that a simple way to do that but it is systematic and it is scientific okay uh, so that is uh, one example All right so we talk about <coughs> just now we're going to look at online assessment tools okay Again, I have another question, three more questions to be asked. Why formative assessment is important? Saya dah sebut sikit tadi pasal formative assessment. Tapi kenapa formative assessment is important? Especially formative assessment ni, we are not grading it. Uh, maybe tuan-tuan dan perempuan, uh, doktor-doktor sekalian boleh respon. Kenapa sebenarnya formative assessment ni penting? to make sure the students are on the right track. Mm -hmm. To see if we have achieved our lesson objective. Okay. To check on the students understanding. What else? What uh why do you think formative assessment is important? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A measure of understanding, tools of student feedback. What is it for us actually, Swanya? Bila kita buat formative assessment ni, when we mentioned just now, most of it is actually, it's about the students. But what is it for us? Maybe you can also answer from that scope. Kalau tidak, kita tak adalah susah-susah kan buat formative assessment. Dah lah tak marking kan? Dah lah tak, tak ada markah untuk student. Tapi kita nak make sure students ni, kita boleh measure understanding of our student. But what is it for us? When we do this formative assessment ni, apa yang kita dapat?
Ada lagi nak respon? Udah lebur lah kata Orang perak kata tapi saya bukan orang perak Okay Right um, Formative assessment is actually when we look at um, uh, Why do we need to do formative assessment? First of all, yes, it is because a measure of uh, to to on students in this thing. Tapi yang kena sebenarnya, it gives a feedback to us as well. Sebab bila kita buat formative assessment ni, kita dapat, we can see that whether as a majority of our students ni sebenarnya faham ke tak dengan apa yang kita cuba nak sampaikan. Okay. Uh, and at the same time, kita boleh correct the students immediately. <coughs> Because as you know, if let's say you give a test, you give a quiz that needs some time Even for example, you give open-ended assessment When you give open-ended assessment ni, it's not, it's not easy Nak marking tu, ambil masa yang berkurun, kan? Maksudnya, kadang-kadang kita-kita Macam contohnya hari tu, macam saya lah buat extended assessment Untuk final year, final semester We, because in UTP right now, we are in week 3 We just finish uh, our semesters last month Dan lepas tu ada break sekejap And now students dah masuk week 3 dah ni uh, Untuk new semester So in between that uh, Bila kita nak marking tu I think it takes about For me it's about 2 weeks a half Actually to mark 170 scripts okay And satu hari tu dapat 10 script tu pun kira dah Dah bagus sangat lah sebab We have to check uh, from the rubric We need to give mark from the rubric Okay. Tapi bila kita bagi, uh, kita kadang-kadang kita lambat lah kita nak bagi balik feedback kepada student Jadi student sometimes macam saya cakap tadi, dia dah terlambat untuk tahu sebenarnya apa yang dia belajar ni betul atau tak So when we do the formative assessment, especially during online new session It makes the correct understanding, it improve dia punya understanding immediately Okay, because we give feedback to them um, At the same time, it give feedback to us Sebenarnya apa yang kita buat ni betul ataupun tak betul, right So uh, that is uh, very much why it is important to us for us to use formative assessment. So what are the online tools suitable for formative assessment? Maybe you can respond on this. We have something like macam macam yang saya pakai sekarang um Mentimeter. So that is actually uh, one suitable tool. Uh, because Mentimeter ni, you can do plenty of things uh, One is open-ended punya questions uh, Of course, and then you can have certain kind of polls, activity You can also have macam quiz So, um, I, I always stick to actually using Mentimeter lah Sebab Mentimeter ni, um, it's, it's very good lah When actually you want to create the questions You can have ni lah, cumanya uh, I think in order for you to have unlimited punya slides ni you need to subscribe uh, I can't remember, I think ada ada subscribe tapi hari tu bayar, tak ingat berapa Tapi that is one of the two Okay um, See, you can see that you can use Google Form <coughs> University Platform You can also use quizzes, okay So many of you highlighted quizzes here hmm? Yes, you can use Telegram, Telegram poll uh, I also have Telegram with my group of students um, And usually this is I use this for informal punya announcement, informal punya conversation with the students and this is where actually <coughs> bila saya ada telegram ni <coughs> I always highlight to the students that whenever you have a question ask in the telegram group do not PM me directly <coughs> sebab um, that particular question tu may be important for your friends juga maybe your friends sebenarnya Tak tahu pun, dia, dia tak tahu tentang benda tu So, might as well <coughs> encourage the students to ask in the large community Tapi first of all, you have to make sure that the community is safe Okay, safe from cyber bully, safe from uh, youth sendiri Kadang-kadang kita, kita, kita kadang-kadang kita tak sedar, kadang-kadang kita pun terbully student So, we have to make sure that it is safe from that So, only then when the student feel safe to ask questions They will ask in that, in, in that, in that group um, so we have a lot of things here like vision hole, book widget, padlet, quizzes, flip grid, so creative, uh, poll everywhere. Okay, right? And here, 
I'm going to share with you. These are yes, these are some of the tools that is actually uh, you can use low bandwidth online formative assessment tool. So these are the tools. Like for example, you can use quizzes. Um, just now, I think quizzes is similar function with Kahoot, <coughs> even similar function with Mentimeter, even with Quizlet. So I think this is can be clustered together. Uh, we have poll everywhere. So poll everywhere ni is also for you to make polls. Uh, but since dulu saya pernah pakai poll everywhere and Kahoot. But now I think Mentimeter can replace both of this. Okay, because Mentimeter have all the features. Let me share a little bit of features, some features on Mentimeter. Um, it's here. Let me tengok. Um, if you go to home. Right, so these are the slides that I have. Actually, I have more here. I've been using this since um, 2018. Okay, 2018. I've been using this uh, Mentimeter. So, um, I have most of it. Right, for example, like this are PCE classes yang saya dah pernah buat. So, <coughs> I pick one of it. Eh? PCE classes, principles of chemical engineering. Uh, okay, bukan, bukan yang ni. Saya buka yang lain. Um, the Jering Hawks PR Alternative Assessment. Saya try. Okay. Ni ada satu yang saya pernah buat dengan student saya. So, saya pernah buat macam quizzes with them. Okay. Um, and then lepas tu kalau contoh ni kita nak add slide, we can just add slide. Right. And then lepas tu kita boleh pilih. Actually sama ada kita nak buat multiple choice, word cloud, open-ended, kita ada scale, kita ada ranking, image choice, question and answer. And we have a quiz competition. Kat sini kita boleh buat quiz. And kita boleh juga jadikan dia sebagai dalam bentuk slide. Everything dalam bentuk slide. So, so, saya pernah buat quiz dengan student. Uh, contohnya, the students, when the students respond, uh, they are the leaderboard. Okay. Lepas tu, sama macam dengan Kahoot. So, the students can respond um, immediately. And after that, they can get uh, to know dia punya what is the stage, apa yang dia telah uh, berjaya. Sama dia, dia dapat answer, correct answer or not kan. Yeah. That is uh, from that. Lepas tu towards the end tu saya boleh letak contohnya one challenging question in my team. Okay. So this is where actually the students ask questions. Okay. Student ask question regularly. When I present this, I pop up this. So the students will start to ask questions and then I can just highlight mark as answered and then there'll be another question come in and then I make further explanation mark as answered and so on. Okay. So that is why actually Mentimeter ni is a bit holistic lah for me uh, because uh, it allows me to do many things uh, in in here uh, instead of using so many tools out there. So what I stick right now, saya yang saya ada ialah I have a Padlet, I have Mentimeter, I'm using Telegram and I'm using uh, Socrative sometimes for uh, online quiz. Maybe you want to know a little bit on Socrative. <coughs> so if let's say you have a Socrative, you can have your um, login when you click on the login you can have either student login or teacher login okay so i have my own uh, teacher login here so when i have login so what i can do is actually i have a set of quizzes so these are my quizzes that i, I have created um i think last yeah, yesterday I create a quiz for my students. So when I have this quiz created, I can add question kat sini, some other multiple choice, true or false or short answer. So I can add questions here. And then after that, when I add everything, I can just save and exit. So what I did after that, I can launch this quiz. Okay. So when I launch this quiz, I can decide which quiz that I have created that I want to launch. For example, like understanding process variables. So I click this next and I can choose the uh, methods, different method and setting. For example, like um, 
I want to give them instant feedback. So usually this is good for formative assessment. Whenever that the students, if let's say you click this, um, the students will be get some feedback from the question. Why they are doing it right? Why is it wrong? Okay. Uh, sometimes if let's say you want to make it for tool for for summative assessment, I would say open navigation. But at the same time, I can shuffle the questions. I can shuffle the answers. So here the students will have different ways uh, at, at each time student will get different question. So this is um, kalau dia contohnya kalau kita ada soalan yang banyak pun dia nak tunggu kawan dia katalah kita bagi 30 minutes of answering question kan. Kalau nak tunggu kawan dia punya jawapan pun um, maybe berjanggut juga sebab sometimes they need to answer certain question first before they reach the question yang kawan dia tengah buat. Okay because the question tu tak sama. Even answers where you put uh, A, B, C, D tu Answers tu pun may be different. Contohnya, you have to answer A, only that is correct. I have to answer B, only then my answer is correct. Okay, and we can give final score. Another one is teacher pace. Teacher pace ni ialah kita sendiri yang control. Okay, uh, lepas 2 minit kita tukar. Lepas 2 minit kita tukar soalan, tukar soalan, tukar soalan. So, there are many method of doing that. And then you can click, um, contoh macam tadi, saya buat uh, open navigation. So, I can click start. So, from here, the students what they do need to do is they go to login, they click on student login dia kena letakkan nama room ni yang ni saya letak nama KRD room sebenarnya kita bergantung pada kita lah nama apa kan room kita nak letak kat sini and then lepas tu dia kena masukkan nama dia dan uh, saya minta dia masukkan nama dan ID okay so from here we can get once they complete everything we click finish okay so when we click finish kita boleh dapatkan uh, reports dekat sini. We can click on the reports. Even actually from the previous one, kita boleh ada report-report uh, uh, quiz yang student dah jawab. Contohnya macam ni. Um, let me see. Uh, bukan ini. Contoh ni, ini ada satu ni. Student dah jawab. Uh, dia dah blank punya name. Tapi bila kita report, kita boleh download report dia dalam bentuk Excel. Okay. Uh, whole class Excel and then I click download so lepas tu bila dia dah download saya akan dapat uh, report dia contohnya nama dia siapa uh, apa score dia ok apa score yang dia dapat apa question yang dia dapat betul dan salah dan kat sini sebenarnya kita boleh tengok student-student uh, kita ni whether which one actually they got it right okay which one yang sebenarnya dia orang ada bermasalah untuk dia faham okay contohnya macam soalan yang ini okay sini soalan yang bukan berbentuk calculation so uh, most of them they are good at it 96.3% can answer it right um, some of the students I think they have most of the student ada difficulty nak answer soalan nombor 4 dengan soalan nombor 5 okay so I need to check what makes them not um, not be able to answer this so I need to fix this, okay? So this is why actually uh, good for you because it gives you some kind of feedback as well. Dia bagi analytics kepada kita, so kita tahu apa yang kita nak address dengan student kita. Alright, so that is actually about uh, some of the tools that we can use here. But most importantly, when you use this kind of tool, kita kena make sure that seperti mana saya cakap tadi kan, bila kita buat um, something kita nak bagi formative assessment dengan students ni, dia ada benda yang kita kena address. Yang pertama sekali ialah students ni, bila kita bagi soalan kepada students untuk student jawab, it is actually for them to do individual construction. They have to think on their own first. They have to think on their own. Selepas tu kita kena bagi peluang interaction with assigned peers in breakout session. Okay. So kadang-kadang dia ada platform contohnya macam Microsoft Teams macam uh, yang kalau kami kat DTV pakai BBB, Big Blue Button so dia ada breakout rooms. So sometimes you can allow the students to be in their breakout session untuk berbincang okay dengan team dia sendiri to find out to to consolidate the answers uh, and then barulah kita sebenarnya minta dia share the answer dengan kita. Because what happen, I think in general sometimes kadang-kadang kita tanya so, kenapa uh, people are not responding to us because whenever that we ask questions, we ask them directly. We call them call. Contohnya terus um, Siti, tolong jawab apa soalan ni. Uh, dia mesti dia terus macam blur. Apa benda aku nak jawab? Tak tahu. 
but then you need to allow them to think first okay <coughs> okay apa kita jawab apakah jawapan kepada soalan kes-kes yang macam ni okay i would like you to have 30 second pk dulu 30 second okay now since you have think about this i would like you to now interact with your friends dalam breakout room ataupun you can through go through whatsapp untuk interact the answer <coughs> with your partner Okay, now, lepas tu barulah panggil nama. Okay, Siti, tadi apa jawapan yang kamu dah bincang dengan kawan kamu? Okay, Ali, apa yang kamu dah bincang dengan kawan kamu? Abu, apa yang kamu dah bincang? Jadi, kita tak perlu tanya everyone, but many of, some of them will need to respond, give answer. And we don't ask for volunteer. Sebab kalau volunteer, dia akan orang yang sama juga berulang-ulang kali. We need to make sure that the students, bila dia berada dalam session dengan kita tu, dia are ready actually to receive that kind of questions. Okay? Um, and then they need to be ready to give the answer. So this is why actually we try to encourage the students critical thinking dalam kita punya online punya session. And <coughs> dalam kalau kita bagi discussion, interaction untuk bincang tentang sesuatu, don't go beyond three minutes. This is also satu benda yang dipesan oleh uh, Professor Richard Felder. Because dia kata kalau it is beyond three minutes, there are students who actually can finish before three minutes. Kalau contohnya kita set 15 minutes. Some of the students, some of the group, they will bincang habis dalam masa tiga minit. So actually we are wasting their 12 minutes time. Okay, so we need to make sure that the discussion time is concise and short so that everybody can give answer. And they have to know that this is not graded so that everybody participate and give answer and and they learn from each other. From that, this is actually we do the community support lah, online community <coughs> learning from that. Okay. So when we talk also about alternative assessment, we know that it is an authentic assessment. It measures what students can do and cannot do. Um, this is beyond the traditional closed book written examinations. And it allows students to receive feedback for improvement by the end of the assignment or while doing the assi assessment. Sebab kalau um, students tu buat exam kan, kalau dia jawab closed book exam as usual tu, dia cuma tahu finally dia akan tahu grade dia sahaja kan. Tama ada betul atau salah, dia buat, dia tak tahu. Tapi alternative assessment ni, it allows students to receive the feedback while doing the assignment. Uh, one of it I'm going to share with you with the flip assessment that that uh, we devise. And it can be easily aligned to outcomes, but it may require more time as well as the effort. So, I would like to ask you some question again dalam Mentimeter ni. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, doktor. Ya. Yeah. Anak uh, apa ada satu soalan dekat chat ni ada tanya soalan pasal Socrative apps tu. Ah, okay. Ah, uh, peserta tanya. Saya nak tanya untuk Socrative apps sudah boleh dapat feedback direct ke? Boleh. Ah, uh, ada ada cara nak share? Boleh boleh sebenarnya. Macam saya share tadi dekat so kreatif ni uh, Bila kita nak launch quiz ni Katalah kita pilih satu quiz Kita boleh bagi macam instant feedback kat sini Kalau instant feedback ni kita dah boleh siap Jawapan siap-siap kenapa dia betul, kenapa dia salah Kita boleh tu bagi question question feedback So setiap kali dia jawab tak ke Salah, lepas tu tiba-tiba dah keluar dah jawapan Kenapa dia salah, sepatutnya gini 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 macam ni So uh, so creative can help you doing that lah. Okay. Uh, okay, so that is uh, one thing, right? So let me share with you, I would like to ask you another thing about um, type of assessment that we can use in order for us to So maybe you can answer to this, okay? Saya ada learning outcome ni to apply analytical and theoretical skills to model and solve mathematical problem. So can you please uh, select which particular assessment is suitable for this? Again, use menti.com and use this code.
actually by doing this sometimes this is a time for you to rest in between lah kan um you can also give a uh, breakout time for the i mean like a uh, rest time for the students tapi at the same time, from time to time, bila kita buat this kind of assessment, kita minta student yang respond, um, this give some time for you to have a, a short rest in between. Okay, so we have here Ada lima orang ni eh <laughs> Lima dia responding, okay And I have more So you see that um, when we decided, okay, this is the cost outcome kita spell out, okay, dalam kita punya uh, learning outcomes to apply analytical and theoretical skills to model and solve mathematical problem. So <coughs> I think many of you responded here, you agree on the multiple choice questions, okay, so we can decide this. For example, macam tadi kita boleh guna macam platform macam soal kreatif, um, kita boleh develop questions and the students can do some kind of calculations and they can answer to that. Okay, that is one option. Second one, we can have online question and answers. So, maksudnya kita post questions dalam online. Kita minta dia buat certain kind of lengthy new calculations. And after that, they can answer that. Um, we give group project to them. So, group project is something yang it will help them to actually uh, work together as a team uh, so that you can have a complex problem and then they can solve it together. You can use much a university platform, model whatsoever to post this, those kind of question. You can also have case studies or role play. Again, this is something that you prepare like in a word document, something like that. You can upload in the in the university platform, and then the students can download and start to do it. Uh, software simulation, anything software yang you boleh relate available online, ataupun sebenarnya boleh pakai VPN, um, so that the students can use those software to simulate it. And we know that essay writing to maybe not so much with reflective writing lah untuk pakai this particular, untuk to meet this particular outcome. Okay, that's good. So you, see, you can start to see that there are many ways actually we can use such a way that we can um, try to uh, address the learning outcome. Second question, to interpret, compare and contrast ideas in the social science. So what is best ways to do to make sure that um, we can we can attain this particular outcome Okay, so um, obviously you can see that um, some of the things that could be done here 
you start to see that reflective writing or essay writing is coming up, um, but not MCQ. Because uh, you know that when you talk to it, interpret, compare and contrast ideas, team, there are many ideas, there is no right and wrong, it's a lot of gray area things and MCQ may not be the right choice because uh, it's only for the objectivists, okay? Because lots of the things are very subjectivist, okay? Very, very subjective. And in, in that way, actually, we should uh, encourage more kind of assessment in a little bit open-ended. Contohnya macam if let's say we are doing group project, you can do something kind of macam online debate, for example. Okay, so you have like a, a team which is a, a, a team of two or three actually trying to uh, justify the answer with another team of three students, okay, on debate on the topics, for example. Um, they could be on the reflective writing, <clears throat> so the students can reflect on what they have gone through, try to put all these ideas together and try to make some kind of comparison. Um, you can also highlight in the case studies or role play, so you can give certain kind of case studies. Um, and then you can also ask them to do essay writing, okay. So these are uh, some things that you we can try in, in actually interpret, uh, compare and contrast ideas in, in social science. How about this one? To demonstrate effective team working skills among peers. So how do we do this online? So again, from here, you can see that uh, one of the way to make sure that team working skills is uh, achieved is by giving the group project, okay? Um, but uh, I'm going to address a little bit on the group project, how we should be able to give effectively group project later on. And, and then when we give the case studies or role play, that is also important uh, so that the students can simulate their uh, team learn, uh, working skills. And of course, when we talk about uh, for example, we talk about um, teamwork, okay? We need to highlight to our students that even, even right now, people are working across the globe, online, right, as a team. So this is the best time actually to simulate that kind of experience by giving them certain kind of project that they can do together online. Um, software simulation is also possible. Because if let's say you have you give a complex problem enough for them to sit two or three of them together and try to solve the problem, um, essay writing maybe and reflective writing maybe coupled together with the case studies or group project, uh, and of course MCQ and online question and answers may not so much, but it can be just a supplementary towards the main case studies role play or group project. Okay, so that so this is to clearly highlight to you that in order for us to do the assessment for our students, we cannot just simply follow the, the norms that, okay, I have to do a quiz, I have to do assessment, uh, I have to do assignment, I have to do group project, whatsoever, follow everything uh, as what has been instructed because we need to decide based on what is the outcome that we actually have um, prepared for the course. Okay. <clears throat> so here, um, if you go to this particular website, they will give you, for example, different kind of learning outcomes. There are different ways of doing that, okay? For example, like article, case study, essay, and so on. So these are actually uh, the learning that they have listed the learning outcomes in this website. And if, let's say, you have not, you are not sure that what kind of assessment that you should be doing, try to visit this website. And they will assist you in making sure that you actually reach the, you, you can know what kind of assessment that you could do for your students. So as I thought just now about um, giving group project, okay? So one of the things that you have to make sure that whenever that you give group project is actually, uh, you want to make sure that the, the, group, the group 
the team work is actually towards cooperative group and high performing pro cooperative group. You do not want to them to become what we call as a pseudo group. Pseudo group ni is a fake group. Fake group ni maksudnya, okay, kalau you nampak individual members kat sini, ada empat orang. One, two, three, four. Okay, as a traditional group, usually what they did is a divide and compile. <coughs> okay, divide and compile. Um, you give certain certain kind of uh, assignment for them and then everybody, okay, you take this part, you take this part, this part. The night before, then everybody compile and then uh, and then on the day itself, they submit. No no one has checked in terms of the what other people has been doing. They have not been discussing about it, okay. Sometimes when we give the project in week one, week two, bila kita minta submit week 14, dia seminggu sebelum tu, Paling bagus seminggu sebelum tu lah dia buat. Kalau tak, malam tu lah dia buat kan? Baru dia nak submit. Tak kita. So the quality of work is not as what we expected. Okay. Kita tak boleh salahkan student sebab one of the things that we supposed to do is actually is our fault as well because we need to check the student's uh, progress. That is one thing. But how do we make sure that the students need be able to achieve what we call as cooperative, sorry. What we, to achieve cooperative, sorry. Right? To achieve cooperative group or high performing cooperative group. So what they need to, to have is actually we need to make sure that the students whenever that we give cooperative learning ni, there are five principles that we have to address. First thing first ialah what we call as positive interdependence. Maksudnya, student ni, they are depending to each other. Okay, we rise, we rise together. We fall, we sink, we sink together. Kalau macam Titanic tu, memang tenggelam sama-sama. Okay, so that is a positive interdependence which means that everybody support each other. Everybody is mana dia mem saling saling memerlukan antara satu sama lain. So that is where actually a good project should be should be done. Contohnya kalau kita bagi group project, kita bagi essay untuk student tulis. That is not a good group project because an essay can be only done by one student. It doesn't have to be divided into five students contohnya. Okay, so the type of project that we need to give is complex enough that it cannot, cannot be done by only one or two person. If let's say we have a team of four or five. And usually, dalam satu team, kita cannot have more than six. Two to four is a good number. Okay. The second one is individual accountability, which means that everybody ada accountable kepada apa benda yang dia kena buat. And you should have face-to-face -face interaction, which means that <coughs> students need should regularly meet in order for them to meet the milestones Okay, in order for them to solve the project, that is the first one. Second one is, um, kena ada juga interaction dengan lecturer. So, lecturer has to check the progress from time to time. Uh, appropriate interpersonal skills, this is where actually the skills come in. For example, like teamwork skills, negotiating skills, communication skills. So, that is where appropriate inter interpersonal skills come in. And we should have a regular group function assessment. <coughs> regular group function assessment means that the students need to rate themselves regularly. Um, dia ada macam team uh, improvement, team feedback. Um, <coughs> bukan maksudnya tunggu towards the end baru kita buat peer rating. Tapi peer rating contohnya kalau kita ada 6-7 minggu punya projek, maybe we should collect at least twice dia punya peer rating. Okay, sometimes in the middle and sometimes towards the end. Because kalau kita buat towards the end, Usually when the students have overcome dia punya trauma buat this project, dia akan rated everybody sama je equally walaupun ada student yang tak menyumbang langsung kepada project tersebut. But <coughs> when actually you try to assess them during the crisis because of course along the way dia akan buat project tu dia akan face some kind of crisis. Dia macam ada trauma cycle dia. So at the deep bottom dekat situ when they reach the deep bottom that is also you want to do some kind of assessment to see that who is actually really work hard for the group project ataupun ada sebenarnya yang free rider ataupun they are doing it together. So this is um, when you do the uh, peer rating that is uh, very important for you to 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 do ni lah to make sure that this is highlighted. I would like to share with you um, macam mana nak buat um, peer rating yang bagus lah kan. So <coughs> So here I can share with you one of the peer rating that I have done in the past. Okay. So here, instead of I ask my student <coughs> to give markah numbers, 
I just ask them to rate their friends based on this uh, rubric. Contohnya kalau studi kawan dia excellent, uh, they they consistently when I try to zoom ni. Okay. If let's say um, they, they 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 want to rate their friend excellent or they themselves excellent, they will say consistently went above and beyond and beyond to third group mate carry more than his or her fair share of the discussion. Do more lah something yang kat sini eh. <coughs> Patu ada yang very good, good, satisfactory, ordinary, marginal, deficient, unsatisfactory, superficial, and no show. So here I ask the students to write their group name, their name. The ID number, their own rating and then lepas tu dia punya team members number one name, team member rating. Um, ada juga yang form yang saya letak minta dia bagi constructive feedback kepada team member dia. So what I did is sometimes I compile this and I pass to the, when we compile this, okay, I ask the help from the, my graduate assistant for example. So they compile this and we pass, give it back to the students. So the students receive the feedback anonymously lah. <coughs> what is the appreciative feedback as well as uh, constructive feedback. So similarly, I did for uh, everything else lah, everything, so team members semua. And then lepas tu kita compile kan everything. And then from here, this is where actually I convert this into numbers. So for example, excellent akan dapat 10, very good 9, good 8 and so on. Jadi bila saya campurkan everything, I will get a coefficient number. So some kind of coefficient number lah. So bila katalah kita bagi markah kepada student tu 80 kepada group project dia. So setiap student tu akan dapat different markah. Contohnya kalau ada student yang dapat 1.05 dia akan multiply with 80 so dia akan dapat markah yang lebih lah daripada kawan dia because of the effort. Right? Because kawan dia pun rated dia higher so in total dia akan dapat markah yang lebih tinggi. So that is one way actually that you can uh, do to make sure that your students are actually learning. Okay? <coughs> Okay, so that is an example of you to give uh, uh, the, the, the good group project for your students lah. Uh, okay, Doktor. Hmm. Ada, ada soalan daripada participants. Dia nak tanya uh, website yang sebelum Doktor share pasal uh, cooperative principle, uh, principle tadi. Uh, yang What's... macam rubric tu, Doktor. Uh, yang ya, ada. Ada Google Form tu? Uh, sebelum tu uh, besar, Doktor. Uh, yang uh. saya tanya, saya yang tanya soalan tu. Aha. Uh, uh, ini, ini. Ya, ya saya pun tanya. Uh, apa yang table yang Doktor Links yang ada uh, types of uh, assessment together with the activities tu? Ya, ini ya. Ya, ini. Ya, saya. Uh, website dia. Ah uh, Tak clear, tak nampak. Tak apa-apa, saya copy dan saya paste kat sini dan you can uh, visit. Okay, baik. Terima kasih, Doktor. Alright. <coughs> okay. So um, now uh, I think let we move to the topic of uh, field assessment, eh? some uh, some brief ideas. We also face a problem with our students. Sebab student kita ni dia, kalau kita dengar macam ni kan, kalau dia kata uh, students ni um, tanya soalan, how can I easily remember this? Uh, will this be in the exam? I think the lecturer didn't teach this at all and uh, it's a lot of exam oriented, a lot of memorization. So this characteristic criteria ni menyebabkan student kita sebenarnya adalah surface learner. <coughs> surface learner ni, dia salah satu kita, ciri dia juga ialah dia terlalu bergantung harap pada kita. Apa yang kita cakap, semua betul. Kita lah the only source of knowledge for them. Dia sendiri rasa macam for them, in order for them to open textbook kena nak baca for them to actually go and find other material ke they nak go through um, it's become difficult for them. Sedangkan contoh, kalau kita ambil contoh our materials ni kalau dia cari kat YouTube <coughs> plenty. Kalau dia malas sangat nak baca buku lah kan. Dia pergi cari kat YouTube tu pun resources tu punyalah belambak. Tapi dia still nak kita pinpoint kepada dia nak kita ajar dia macam mana cara nak belajar. So these are the actually characteristic of surface learner. Okay. I know I can learn this if you just tell me what I need to know. So they just need to know on on things. Uh, yang kedua ialah 
um, kalau contohnya student tu rasa everyone has an opinion so all are equal so students may distrust authority, reason, abstraction and science so maksudnya dia sendiri pun um, kata semua semua boleh bagi opinion dan uh, semua betul okay semua betul so this is also a type of category of surface learner tapi kalau kita nak lahirkan orang yang deep learner ni students ni they be able to justify themselves they be able to say that okay this is the thing that I'm doing and this is correct and why it is correct they be able to justify themselves so these are the type of deep learner <coughs> saya ambil contoh selalunya dalam um, because ada satu video ni cerita pasal surface learner dengan deep learner dia guna solo taxonomy solo taxonomy ni kalau google nanti boleh carilah what is solo taxonomy okay uh, S-O-L-O eh S uh, structure observed learning outcome uh, taxonomy So dalam soalan tu dia tanya student-student ni What is a cow? Lembu tu apa? Uh, kalau surface learner dia akan jawab Lembu tu the the cow when it is milking Maksudnya dia bila dia bagi susu Itu dah lembu Tapi sebenarnya kucing pun bagi susu juga kan Takkan kucing tu pun lembu So that is actually how they actually uh, Give the answer Ada ataupun ada setengah uh, Student yang dikata Lembu tu kalau dia hidup dia boleh bagi susu kalau dia dah disembelih, dia boleh bagi kulit, dia boleh bagi lemak, dia boleh bagi daging, dia boleh bagi ah uh, itulah dia bagi dia kata. So that is still a category of surface learner, only be able to classify things. But when actually you want to produce a deep learner, salah seorang student ni menjawab dia kata lembu ni um, dia ada banyak kategori dan saya boleh nampak dia ada ciri-ciri sama dengan DNA manusia sebab dia ada yang besar, dia ada yang kecil, ada yang kulit color ni, ada yang kulit color ni Sama lah juga dengan manusia yang macam mana manusia pun ada different kind of categories Maksudnya dia dah start buat relativity Relatif dengan apa yang uh, connect dengan benda lain yang boleh belajar Okay So It is very rare at the moment Susah kita nak dapat pelajar-pelajar kita yang deep learner Sebab as for now Ramai student yang masuk universiti Because there are plenty of universities out there and some of them they just want the certificates <coughs> and they just want to get job later on even job that is not related to their field they just want to grad, that's all tapi sebenarnya kita nak ajar dia kemahiran-kemahiran six skills contohnya thinking skills, analytical skills ni yang penting untuk dia pakai masa dia bekerja nanti it requires them to become a deep learner so how do we actually nurture this deep learner ni? so this is one of the things that we can do even during PKP ni uh, even this thing I have done in the past and it works wonder lah, it works well so I call this as flip assessment so what do you think it means by flip assessment? <coughs> sebab pernah dengar kan pasal flip, flip classroom flip classroom ni dia tak sama dengan flip assessment flip classroom ni ialah students need to prepare beforehand okay, lepas tu dia akan buat um, assignment, eh sorry student akan prefer uh, watch the video or so ever lepas tu dia bila datang kelas kita buat activities okay so that is what means by flip classroom tapi flip assessment ni ialah cuba fikir students think like us how about actually kita jadikan student tu sama macam kita so that is what is meant by flip assessment <coughs> sebab kita tahu whenever that we want to create exam questions kan kita akan struggle kita sendiri sebagai lecturer nak cari ilham kan nak cari ilham soalan apa nak ditanya masa dalam exam nanti uh, kita sendiri kita rasa macam uh, apa benda apa uh, and it gonna give us some time lah for us to ni lepas tu kita kena buka buku kan in order for us to come up with good question kita kena tengok chapter tu okay I want to assess based on this chapter <coughs> so kita kena buka baca balik everything barulah kita come up dengan good question so why not we give this kind of experience kepada our students and of course it is difficult but it is challenging enough so that they become master mastery in in whatever that they are doing okay so the role of students and learning outcome is addressed so, contohnya students are given a role as faculty members to set up final exam question which is close ended for a specific learning outcome <coughs> it must be an original question and solution Uh, 70 to 80% of the question must be on higher taxonomy so this is what I usually give to my students uh, I said to them you have to choose the right guide word based on the attachment given okay the right guide word 
And then I said, students may include analogy to the daily application or any industry related process because they are learning it something to do with engineering, but it's not necessarily limited to engineering. Eh? And students must prepare a complete solution, which include the derivation and step-by-step -step solution to the final answer. And I said, it must be a tailored to close book format, free from grammatical English and English related error formatted well and so on. And I said to them, you are advised not to prepare too many guided sub questions as guided question may bring the level of taxonomy towards low order thinking skills taxonomy. So here, saya ajar student tentang Bloom taxonomy. Okay, Bloom taxonomy uh, and then give them choice of guide words and so that they come up with a good question. Lepas tu, apa yang saya buat ialah saya develop um, Ternitin. So Ternitin ni kita ada high order thinking skills, kita ada originality in term of the solution as well as format language. So high order thinking skills ni tengoklah level question yang dia tanya. Originality ni lah contohnya macam uh, when I check to the throughout the Ternitin, berapa banyak percentage yang um, <coughs> berapa banyak percentage of the similarity so and then solutions as well as uh, solution ni saya boleh check kat sini sama ada ada plagiarism ataupun tak. Sebab sometimes most of the time kalau student tu dia tak tahu kita akan nampak dia punya working solution jalan-jalan-jalan-jalan lepas tu terus lompat lepas tu dapat jawapan. Maksudnya ada benda yang dia tak include kat situ which is not complete. So perhaps sometimes they may just copy somewhere else. Okay. Sebab yang ni dia memang kena buat calculation yang betul lah. Contohnya bila saya buat based on the calculation kan. Tapi it doesn't have to be calculation. It can be many things that can involve here. Contohnya macam kalau dalam computer science banyak involve dengan diagram apa, analog, apa all those flow, flow, flow things kan. Uh, macam Puan Sam Sahaja apa, networking kan semua tu kan. So you can actually uh, ask the student to develop the question on their own lepas tu give the, the the final answer. Right. So this is example lah, example of the assignment. Contohnya you are the newly appointed technical engineering lecturer for second year degree student. Lepas tu I, I highlight that the, the dean would like to see an improvement from the past exam question. He feels that it will be very easy to the student if you only address on first order reversible reaction. So I give them a big challenge. He wanted to see the question involve second order reversible reaction. So it's a bit um, challenging from here. Okay. And then I said I spell out a further requirements dekat sini to prepare the exam question, it must include here, so on, so on. Tolong baca je, eh, Syed? Okay, so, um, and then I said, ask them to submit through turn it in, and then lepas tu, from that, I do the assessment lah. Okay. So, this is the example of the question. So, for example, like, sorry. So the students yang ni dia min, minat dia, selalunya students kan dia bila dia buat soalan ni dia based on the minat dia. Saya pernah dapat soalan uh, yang berkait dengan Harry Potter, Batman, Avengers. Lepas tu yang ni macam student ni dia memang minat. Dia ni uh, black, memang heavy metal punya ni. Dia suka heavy metal. So memang dia kaitkan uh, question dia ni dengan pasal gitar dia pasal on the music, um, on, on the music itself. And then some of the data tu dia boleh he create on his own but then dia buat further calculation lah. Calculation ni saya tak tunjuk kat sini lah tapi these are the um, examples yang dia highlight. Contohnya what are the assumptions? Sorry. What are the assumptions you need in order to proceed? Uh, assuming an equilibrium conversion etc. And uh, they, they suggest the tanya kat sini, how would you propose increase the conversion? So, so these are questions of high level punya, belum taxonomy level. So in such a way that when I do the evaluation, I can give a higher mark for him lah because the recipe solutions pun correct, complete and appropriate format and acceptable grammatical error. So he got 94 for this. Okay, so that is this. Doktor, boleh tak doktor, doktor zoom oh, sikit? Tak. Ah, tak ah. Yang ni tak, 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 tak ni sangat lah. Tapi yang ni soalannya, soalannya example je kan. Uh, hmm. Saya nak zoom macam mana eh. <laughs> Oh sebab dia daripada sini. Ah sebab kan? saya dah ni kalau nak tengok macam tu jelah saya zoom. Ah okey. Ah pecah sikit. Um, ah, okay. tapi kalau saya buka saya try buka Tanitin. Semua ada subscription Tanitin kan? Dia ada ada dok. Ah maksudnya kalau maksudnya dia boleh submit through Tanitin. Um,
ha, ni. Some of the question tu, saya sekarang ni untungnya hidup saya sebab saya nak cari soalan tu tak susah dah lah. Sebab um, dah ada apa, when they do the question, some of the question is good. So I can use those question, I modify a little bit, I can I can just give this as part of the test, I can give it as part of the exams uh, for the junior, something like that kan. Even I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, ini ialah satu, satu soalan yang saya ambil untuk diberikan kepada final exam later on. So the students create the, the questions and then lepas tu um, they provide the answers, they provide the working solutions in the details, okay. And then um, they, they highlight everything lah, okay. So when I, so I give, when I give marks, so here this is rubric yang saya dah create. <coughs> so dia bagi rubric kat sini, then I can pick actually what kind of marks that I can give lah um, from here. Okay, so that is actually um, how flip assessment works in a way lah. So I collected some of the feedback from my students. Uh, some of the students, these are third year students. Tahun, saya start buat benda ni daripada tahun 2015. Um, so which means that the students give rated higher when they said that it allows them to revise the whole chapter and it gives them a deeper understanding on that topic, okay. So why I think this is suitable right now because as I mentioned earlier, some of our students in India are the issues dengan internet affordability and accessibility. So I usually give this uh, assignment ni selalunya dua, I call it take home test. And I usually sometimes I give up to two weeks for them to complete it. Because you know that as a lecturer kita sendiri pun mahu banyak hari, beberapa hari come out to the question. So I give them two weeks so that they can dream on it. They boleh sit down and think about what kind of question that I should come out. So before they nak keluarkan dengan soalan tu, dia kena buat revision dulu. There are many steps towards before they come out dengan question tu. Okay. And even students tu, dia kata dia kena reiterate. Banyak buat kali calculation in order for them to come out with the good question. So the students say themselves, for example, the reflection, dia kata this is interesting method of learning. As for me, I believe that we as students have to give our full commitment to complete the task. Uh, dia kata, I think it is good for students to be practiced as they need to fully understand a topic to create question about it. <coughs> Thus, by hook or by crook, they need to understand the topic very well. Um, uh, dia kata, student will complain, it's hard and all that. Memang dia susah. Soalan ni susah tapi sebenarnya uh, we what we can do in between that is we can give certain kind of uh, calculations. I also, what I did is actually I give examples. I give past year papers kat dia orang so that they can start to look at it and uh, relate and then try to answer it first barulah dia dapat idea lah macam mana soalan dia nak dapat buat okay uh, sub, uh, ada student kata I love the idea of take home test but I'm not that creative um, so dia rasa risau sebab dia kata nanti orang lain copy kan okay um, sepatutnya idea the flipping the assessment but maybe because it was the first time so I took it some time for me to adapt with the new way of learning thanks um, dia kata yang ni susah Lepas tu seorang lagi student, last semester my result is improving than the other semester. So I feel I will try my heart and my best for the other next semester to keep improving. Yang ni student ni dia jawab uh, selepas dia, selepas dia ambil, ambil exam semua tu. So he or she feel that he can master the topic, the subject very well. Uh, it was absolutely the best way to test your student. It really helped me in understanding the topic. Ini yang saya buat baru ni, uh, test dengan student first year. Saya ajar budak first year pula. So some of them, they answer, uh, yang ni masa dia orang dekat universiti lagi, some of them. And then, uh, ada yang city urban areas, ada yang small town village. And I have uh, like 12, 15% uh, yang internet speed dia less than 512 kilobyte per second. Uh, so they mentioned that I like the idea of creating exam questions. So some of them because dia punya topik ni dia, dia masih baru eh. Dia macam tak terbiasa dengan spoon feeding. Tapi bila buat macam ni, dia rasa terkejut. So ada yang marah jugalah tu kan. <laughs> ada sikit yang marah. Okay. And then lepas tu, tapi for them they agree. Uh, they have flexible time in attempting the question. And they agree that, that is actually allow them to revise the whole chapter. Okay. And it also give them rich higher order thinking skills. And then now they say that most of them agree that they actually have mastered the topic. Okay. They agree they have mastered the topic. Um, they found that the test, the home test is some of it very difficult. Ada uh, 40% say it's difficult and yang lain dia kata just right. Uh, among the criteria, choose the biggest constraint for you to attempt. So kata, dia kata masalah yang besar dia ialah 
I have limited creativity. So student ada masalah creativity kat sini. Which is systematic sebenarnya. Dia systemic. Dia memang daripada awal kan. Kita daripada sekolah, we never teach them to become creative in solving problems. So it's a big challenge for them lah, especially the first year student. Um, so students kata, dia kata I prefer to do home test compared to open book test. Sebab dia kata yang ni uh, masa dia panjang. So they can do this better. I know one of the students said, I love the idea of allowing the student to be creative in designing the question as long as they show good understanding of the topic and provide logical question and answer. In my personal case, it makes the topic more approachable and interesting. I think this kind of assessment is good to increase mastery on a specific topic, but the downside it is very time consuming. <coughs> Overall, I think it's a good approach. Basically, the home test can be considered as a good idea for students to develop their creativity and master a chapter. So they will not be limited to one answer like in the normal test but instead they can also widen their knowledge. So what happened to these students, they only have this last semester. Um, the grades are significantly better compared to the uh, previous one because um, I can see that uh, the students understand very well. Uh, kalau saya kata, saya saya bagi tahu kat student tu sendiri, when I compare myself as a first year student last time 20 years ago, Compared to you trying to understand this topic, I think your understanding is much better than me because you can relate the this particular topic dengan uh, your real life applications keliling you and you know how that in principle works, uh, which is good, which is brilliant. So I think um, this allow the students to become uh, better lah in that way. Okay. Just <coughs> Okay. So this was the end. Um, on certain tips and tricks, uh, ada benda yang kita kena fikir when actually you want to do assessment, uh, purpose of the assessment, what to assess, how to assess them, who will do the assessment and suitability of the assessment for the students. So we need to think about this. Of course, another one when we do the emergency remote teaching, um, we shouldn't be giving them too many assignments. Try to give uh, at least one assignment per learning outcome. So macam tadi, when you give, I give that kind of assignment, assignment saya akan allocate usually 10%. 10% of the course work mark. <coughs> Which is high, very high. Tapi saya rasa dia berbaloi sebab student put a lot of effort to that. Um, duration need to be considerately, considerately decided. We need to avoid any unplanned assessment, sorry, at all cost. Okay, contohnya jangan bagi pop quiz terkejut-terkejut. Hari ni tiba-tiba student datang online, okay now ada pop quiz. So it's not the same as what we do in face to face. Students akan uh, mentally dia akan rasa fatigue lah sebenarnya bila bila dia terkejut macam tu dia tak ready. Okay. Talk to your clicks who teach the same student so the assignments given do not overlap. Uh, sometimes it's good. Contohnya kalau kita buat uh, assignment ni, kita kena uh, connect dengan our click so that uh, student tak rasa burden dengan uh, assignment yang overlay kan, uh, maksudnya overlap to each other tu and at the same time, kalau kita bagi group project, it's good if let's say we can do integrated project dengan other course uh, so that the students can see the connection, that's one thing the second one is students akan nampak benda ni serious sebab uh, all the lecturers are focusing on towards that particular project okay um, and then we we give that, is uh, actually because it's actually towards achieving the same thing ke kita nak achieve teamwork skill so why give so many project to the students while actually we want to achieve the same outcome. So that that is uh, the most important part that we have to realize lah. And we should monitor the student progress when giving pro group project weekly as I mentioned earlier, face-to-face -face interaction and we should give more scaffolding than uh, usual lah. Okay. <coughs> um, so we talk about constructive alignment just now. We just make sure that everything is constructively aligned in such a way that when we do teaching and learning activities, Assessment methods, it support, it, it achieve the learning outcomes yang, yang kita nak lah kan. Uh, another thing that we can do towards the end is actually writing reflection. <coughs> so writing reflection is very important. One thing that I learned is actually when we ask the student to write reflection, is also give feedback to us. And I also learned that one thing of recent actually, we should also give, write, our, write down our reflection so that the students read. Why is that? Because... Um, it give them some kind of a sense of like, okay, uh, if I, um, dia macam tahu sebenarnya kita, kita sendiri ada challenge kita sendiri. And this is what actually it develops the values and empathy among themselves towards, towards us sebenarnya. 
Okay, so uh, reflection ni penting because it allows them whenever that they read back their reflection, it allows them to actually to rethink balik apa benda yang dia dah belajar. So I have done this test um, study when actually the students tu, dia compare dia punya two years reflection when they actually reach the final year, saya minta dia baca balik reflection dia and saya minta dia rating daripada satu ke sepuluh, berapa banyak dia ingat. So some of the students surprisingly dia boleh ingat, dia kata when they read balik reflection dia tu 8 per 10, 9 per 10, dia boleh ingat balik apa benda yang dia belajar during that particular time. So this is a good thing for longer retention untuk to make sure that the knowledge to sustain. Okay, so by them asking them to write reflection. And one of the way to write reflection, I recommend to use this Gibbs reflective cycle. So they can write everything here. Okay, describe feelings, evaluation and so on. Um, in a, in an appropriate way so that it actually nurture dia punya thinking cara memproses cara pemikiran dia so that they be able to write reflection okay so i actually have um, two things that i can I, i would like you to do now um there are actually you can ask me question here um <coughs> okay let me close this one Dia yeah, saya nak minta uh, you can actually respond to this question. Ask me about the session just now. So you can go to menti.com uh, 156274. You can write question here if you want to ask me questions. I can respond to you. But at the same time, I also would like you to go to uh, I'm going to copy this Padlet and I would like you to write down Reflection. That's it. Okay. And then so that it appears to here, so you can write down your reflection. Uh, but before that, let me share with you some of my students' reflection. Uh, I think this is uh, some of the students. They ah uh, yes, they 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 write reflection. Apa benda yang dia belajar? So dia punya feelings, dia punya evaluation, dia punya analysis, conclusion and so on because I keep emphasize them on writing this kind of reflection. Okay. Um, so these are plenty one. So uh, I can read this and actually I can see that what the, they are actually a surface learner, they are also a deep learner because kalau deep learner ni, you can see that the way how they write is detail tau. They can write every single thing, apa benda yang dia belajar apa yang dia rasa dan sebagainya. Tapi ada setengah student contohnya dia akan tulis benda pendek-pendek je. So these are the thing also it allow me to try to see um, to actually try to talk to the students so that ask them to force themselves to write longer. Okay. Right. So if you have any questions you may write the questions but at the same time I also look forward to your reflection sebab pada saya Kalau kita nak suruh tu, student kita tulis reflection, we need also to be good at writing reflection. Um, any question? Uh, ini yang uh, reflection yang saya pernah saya bagi, saya minta student share gambar. At the same time, I also write down my reflection here. So, bila saya tulis reflection saya kat sini, sebab sebelum ni, saya memang hadapi masalah. Saya kata student ni tak genuine dalam write dia punya reflection. Uh, because they always think reflection ni is a way of giving feedback. <coughs> giving feedback. Tapi sebenarnya reflection ni is about insight towards their learning. Sebenarnya apa yang dia boleh buat lagi to make sure that the learning so happening inside the class. Because I always highlight that it takes two to tango kan. Maksudnya daripada student side pun, they also have to participate. On our side pun, kita kena make sure that the students are learning effectively well. So, I give them, for example, my my reflection kat sini. Um, saya highlight kata, <coughs> saya anxious and would like to know more. The good about it, the class runs smoothly, but the bad thing about it, the quietness of the student. So, fortunately, they responded to my Mentimeter because I guess they preferred it that way. I'm trying to give them some kind of assessment and mix up with pre-recorded lectures so that it will help them to learn better. 
uh, saya saja buat lawak dengan dia orang lah. If my students say not engaging with me, I, I find other lecturers to teach them. Okay. So, um, that is, um, and, and in return, ada student ni contoh dia respond, dia kata, Uh, in MBB class, it was good experience for me. Dr. Tazli is very kind and helpful. As for future classes, I will try to be more active in class because I feel pity for Dr. Tazli because sometimes the class was a little too quiet. Okay, so this is the reflection from the students and I hope in the future, he or she will be more participative lah. Yang student ni pula, dia kata, uh, dia kata, I would like to say sorry because due to the inconvenient situation I'm currently at, where my neighbor beside me is having their house being renovated, I can't possibly on my mic to answer or ask any questions. So I just ask any question in the chat room. I'm looking forward to many more lecture with you. Right. So that is uh, also another reflection. So I can see that uh, when you give your reflection, the students read it and they'll be more kinder to you lah in a way. <clears throat> Doctor, is it flip assessment is all about flipping the rules of lecturer and student in creating the assessment? Okay. Um, yes, it is. So kita sebenarnya kita just assess dia ni lah tapi kita bagi fleet assessment ni is a way that the lecturer kita minta students to think like us students to be in our shoes so uh, that is uh, students to be in our shoes only then they understand actually how difficult it is in order for them to get the to, to derive the question but at the same time it, reach, it makes them reach mastery level sebab kalau kita fikir sendiri pun kan dulu-dulu um, masa kita undergrad kita pun taklah pandai sangat, melainkan bila kita dah jadi lecturer ni baru kita rasa pandai sikit kan. Sebab kita kena ajar, kita kena buat assessment, kita kena buat question. So uh, that makes a difference actually. So why not give that experience earlier to our students? Okay, so that's, that's, that's uh, what is flip assessment is all about. <coughs> Sorry if I answered this already but do you make your assessment based on previous student feedback and if yes, what are the things you ask from the students? Okay, um, saya create assessment ni based on not only the feedback from the student <coughs> but based on the observation, based on the analysis of the students punya outcomes. So for example like masa saya balik dari PhD dulu, first time saya mengajar, subjek yang saya ajar tu sampai 20 orang fail. <laughs> 20 orang fail, that subject. And I start to try to dig out actually what goes on. Salah satu sebab dia ialah uh, kebetulan masa time tu ada tiga orang lecturer yang mengajar that subject and we do the, what do you call that, um, turn teaching. Turn teaching ni maksudnya empat minggu saya ambil, lepas tu empat minggu lecturer lain, empat minggu lecturer lain. So what happen is that the students cannot see the connection. Sebab tu student pun dia tak rapat sangat dengan kita because we just be there for few weeks and not long. So the student je tak faham the whole or they cannot see the holistic concept of it. And after that, um, I started to see uh, what I can do better to make sure that my students learn. So I devised much more complex uh, assessment uh, and in a way that I can give feedback, better feedback to them. So this is, uh, it makes them learn better and once they learn better as a student masa during the normal class, Towards the end, the exam tu is easy for them lah. Saya dah start nampak bila towards the end, um, my students not only be able, bukan yang kalau student yang lemah memanglah student yang lemah kan. Tapi some of the student lemah tu pun ada benda yang terisi dalam exam paper dia. Dalam exam paper. Bukan maksudnya bukan dibiarkan kosong. Okay. Ada benda yang dia faham. Especially bila saya buat flip assessment ni, inilah part yang dia boleh jawab dalam exam dia. Kalau ada part soalan, Salah satu soalan tu ialah berkaitan yang pernah soalan yang saya pernah bagi masa as part of the flip assessment yang itu yang dia boleh jawab. Okay. So Alhamdulillah from time to time I have reduced significantly the number of failures uh, yang fail tu sebab memang tak nak masuk kelas dan sebagainya. Saya tak boleh halang dia tu. Tapi most of the time student who show effort, who put effort even they are slow learners, even they are actually student yang lemah they be able to uh, answer that. How to really do constructive alignment for practical skill learning outcomes since we are in ODL, especially involving a laboratory work. Uh, yang ni memang saya tak ada cara lain, memang nak tak nak terpaksa yang mana laboratory work tu, especially hands on experimental work tu, memang kena buat experiment lah kan. So we cannot avoid that lah at all cost. So the only way is how the university or the department buat SOP, belajar-belajar uh, ni datang buat some, some kind of experiment and so on. Um, 
memang there, there is no other ways lah uh, for me to 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 advise so lah memang tak boleh nak avoid lah but one thing what we can do in the future in the long run is uh, if let's say we have this kind of VR virtual reality whatsoever uh, that would help as to preempt them lah kan prepare awal supaya dia orang nampak the scenario and so on tapi still it cannot beat the hands on of of doing that so uh, i cannot provide any other example but for lab work memang tak dapat nak dielakkan especially chemistry chemical engineering lab work they have to do that uh one thing that we did as well uh, what we trying to do is actually we we yang mana untuk first year student can you uh we do this what we call that as um apa backyard experiment Uh, some of the things too, they can do it macam based on simple small kit, small tools ataupun benda-benda yang ada kat rumah tu just to show certain kind of concept. So these are the things that they can do. But on higher end, yang high level, yang tak boleh nak address that, we have to do it at the university. Tapi for our first year, second year students ni, contoh-contoh ni belajar hasil transfer. So we can do that associate dengan dekat benda-benda yang dekat dapur, dengan cooking or whatever, still can be done that way. Uh, even though dia kena cari sedikit kat Mr. DIY pergi cari termometer ke whatsoever kan can be done okay <coughs> right so I think uh, So I, I think I'm giving you opportunity for you to write down your reflection uh, before I pass it to Puan Samsia uh, ataupun ada soalan lagi saya kita check saya ada, tak ada soalan dekat sini okay um, even kat sini pun tak ada soalan um, okay anything to ask um, so by the way I can be rich uh, here So kalau nak cari saya, saya ada, saya tengah berjinak-jinak buat YouTube channel. So ada channel YouTube Dr. T ni adalah dekat sini kan. Uh, you can email me at tazliazizan at utp.edu.my. I'm here, my social presence is uh, at www.drtazli.com, drtazli.com. I also blog sometimes at tbitocean.com. Uh, this is my Facebook, uh, my LinkedIn as well as my Twitter. So if uh, we glad if let's say you want to know about more tips you can go to dr t and then there are tips on actually uh, there are actually chemical engineering related contents here but at the same time i also make um, some videos actually on the teaching and learning okay i'm trying to do it weekly since this pkp so uh, i hope that that will be beneficial to some of you um puan samsia Can I pass it back to you? Uh, Doktor, sebelum tu ah. uh, Kalau yang sebagai uh, group project ni Aha. Kalau dalam group member dia ada masalah Macam mana? Uh, group member dia ada masalah Kalau dalam group project dia ada masalah Aha. Okay, uh, uh, adakah kita boleh jadi penamai ataupun yang mereka selesaikan masalah ya? Jadi dalam grup projek tu lah. Uh, kalau ada masalah sebenarnya I would um, I, I think the students need to consult to us dan lepas tu kita boleh buat meeting dengan student yang dalam grup projek tu lah. Uh, hmm. I, think, I think we allow them a reflect, reflective sharing. Maksudnya kita kita bagi dia peluang untuk they sit down together as a team and then everybody kita kena ajar dia confront lah confronting to each other kan uh, so I think benda-benda macam tu yang menyebabkan sometimes our our students ni dia bila dia keluar ke dia kalau kita tak betul-betul nurture dia dalam teamwork itu yang menyebabkan dia bila dia keluar nanti dia tak boleh nak bekerja dalam satu pasukan kan tapi the problem juga kita ni lecturer sebenarnya kita lah paling silo sebenarnya <laughs> That's why kita, kita, kita punya example, good example kita ialah actually we have to work as a team kan uh, hmm. Contoh macam tadi, integrated project Integrated hmm. project tu um, Integrated project tu dia menyebabkan 
dia allow to show that okay oh student pun nampak oh lecturer pun they team up together in order for them to come out with this project so why not we actually we do this as a team then uh, the best for us kan so um that's one thing lah and regularly sebenarnya provide feedback tu is very important lah very important hmm. okay Alright, okay, that, uh, Tava, you can wrap up for this session. Okay. okay, Sam can hear? Yes, 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 I can hear. Okay, so terima kasih kepada Prof. Matia Dr. Muhammad Tazli Azizan atas perkongsian yang sangat manfaat dan diharap dapat membantu kita semua pensyarah dari segi assessments. Hadirin sekalian diingat juga untuk melengkapkan borang kehadiran dan maklum balas. Borang kehadiran dan maklum balas adalah sekaligus. Okey, kita boleh rujuk link dekat ruangan chat. Okey, untuk makluman semua, Hytel akan menganjurkan beberapa lagi siri online training selepas ini dengan menjemput pencerama dari dalam dan luar UITM. Dengan ini, para hadirin boleh merujuk kepada jadual training yang telah dikongsikan sebelum ini. Okey, pihak kami sekali lagi mengucapkan terima kasih kepada terima kasih kerana sudi untuk meluangkan masa untuk sesi online training pada pagi ini. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Kita gambar ramai-ramai sikit boleh tak? <laughs> boleh, boleh, boleh. Ah, okey. Ah, uh, jap. Hmm, saya tukar layout sikit ya. On camera, on camera. Ah, sekejap. Ah, ah. Semua kena on camera. Ah, semua kena on camera. Ah, okay. Ah, minta semua peserta on camera boleh? Ah, kita nak ambil gambar sikit. Bukti-bukti hari ni. Haa. <laughs> <laughs> Boleh uh, pegang on camera okay. ah, Wow ada Ada pakai snap camera tu <laughs> Tapi mungkin tak keluar <laughs> okay. Okay, okay Boleh Okay tak Okay sekejap eh <laughs> Positi Positi ke yang pakai auzi tu Oh, bukan. Oh, hati. Okay, okay, okay. Alright, ready? One, two, three. Okay, kita. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Doktor nak minta uh, kebenaran lah untuk dapatkan slide daripada doktor. Boleh? Nanti doktor Boleh. share uh, slide. Nanti Boleh. Saya, uh, share dengan nanti saya share dengan sekali dengan uh, result uh, mentimeter tu. Okay, boleh doktor. Alright. Terima kasih banyak-banyak semua. Terima kasih doktor sebab sharing. Banyak maklumat yang kita belajar kat hari ni. Alright. Uh, okay. Terima kasih doktor. Nanti kita akan invite doktor untuk the next. Uh, the next boleh, boleh. Boleh. Lagi. InsyaAllah. Okay. Insya okay, thank you. Alright. Okay. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Thanks doktor for the fruitful sharing. Really clear and can understand. You're welcome. Thank you.